maybe I'll start since I posed the question. So I'm Chris. Hi, everybody. I'm from um, California. Uh, so it's, it's I'm still at work. And uh, you can sort of see behind me, that's my 68 uh, 260B. And, you, you bought that? Who'd you buy that from? Uh, Bob Fox. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, Mary Jane. Wow. So on Monday, I had a, two, a 50 Hello? and a 250, which I sold. And now I'm down to one Comanche. So yeah, that's the one. Hey, I'm talking to Patricia Jane. Chris Burnley. Cool. Welcome. I'm talking to you. We're in one. one. We're on a Zoom call with a bunch of Comanche hey, people. Hey, Ken, can you mute? No. Ken Rivard, PA24, 260B, Merritt Island. Anyways, I'm trying to get a hold of Mary Jane. Yeah, well, mute your, uh, mute, mute your, your, mute your microphone. Mute your mic, Ken. <laughs> All right, I'm Dave Gittleman. Uh, and behind me is my Comanche. Okay. It's a 180, and I've owned it for 51 years. Whoa! Wow! Oh, nice. uh, Gloria's on, by the way, but I'm not zooming. I'm just listening. No. Okay. Awesome. Well, Gloria, <laughs> say your last name too, so everybody knows it's the Gloria. Oh, it's Gloria Smith, and years. sometimes Gloria Smith Zawaski. I know. I'm next week. I'll be oh. Zoom like <laughs> efficient. Video. <laughs> You'll have to do your hair. You realize that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have to do the roots. <laughs> um, oh, is everyone Jay sitting stuff. in front of their airplanes? I wish I could see that. I know. Not everybody, but some of them. I'm sitting here with a cat climbing on me. I'm CJ Stump. Um, I'm Bernie Stump's daughter. And uh, in addition to flying dad's Comanche, I'm caretaking a 180, and I love it. 7654 pop for a marine stationed overseas. It's Sean Cassie. Uh, I'm Keith Morris. I got uh, two Comanches actually I hang on to now. Uh, my old one is sitting down there on the ramp waiting for the insurance company to collect it. And my new one is also down on the ramp and I love it. Got a 250. Uh, with the old one is a 60 and this is a 63. And uh, from Rochester, New York area. I have a, a 66 uh, B twin command. Not an important one. Okay. I'm Tim Wagner, 758 Salem, Ohio. Uh, APIA, take care of my own airplane. Been flying for 46 years. Whoa. Whoa. Wow. Owned the Comanche for 16 of those. Welcome wow. aboard. Greg Hannon from uh, Lawton, Forest Hill, flying a 1960 uh, 250 Comanche, and I've had it since 2003. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Kat Keeper. I have a PA39 Twin Comanche, and uh, it's been in our family since it was new, so it turned 50 on February 16th, and I've been flying either as passenger or PIC for 49 years. Well, who was that? I'm sorry, I missed who that was. Pat Keeper. Oh, hi. <laughs> hey, Gloria. Another year, hi. Another year, Pat, and you'll get the right Master Pilot Award. <laughs> <laughs> if I make it that far. Yeah, you'll make it. <laughs> you will. Well, and you know, Dave, I have that. you for inspiration, and I have Al Powers up. for inspiration. <laughs> Well, I'll uh, introduce myself. I'm Tom Langland. I've had my twin Comanche for about 10 years. I'm all, all right. Uh, I'm not sure where we got cut off, but uh, I'm Tom Langland. I have a turbo twin Comanche for about a little over 10 years now. And uh, I also have Ray J Turbo Products and uh, Bob Fields Air Accessories. So thanks for uh, putting all this on. And uh, uh, it's impressive how everyone's joined in such a uh, you know, short notice. That's pretty powerful. Uh, social media results. You know, it's just about time for uh, Zach to do his thing. Any last words from anybody? I oh, just want to say hello, everyone. To Hans Pittner. Hi. Hey, Hans, you made it. Hello, Hans. Hi. Okay, I'm going to mute everybody, and then Hans, uh, then uh, Zach will take over. Zach Grant coming to you from uh, wonderful, sunny uh, Indianapolis, Indiana this afternoon. Going to apologize, uh, being that, uh, you know, I haven't touched an airplane at work since uh, the 
3rd of March, due to all of this uh, fun and games that we're having with the, uh, whatever you want to call it, the uh, coronavirus, Wuhan flu. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I have found myself to be even busier than usual, which is uh, very difficult for me to do. And uh, a couple of days uh, ago, got uh, uh, tapped to do this. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I really didn't have a whole lot of time to do uh, much, get a, a PowerPoint put up uh, so that you guys can see. So I'm just going to try and read some stuff off of the other screen as my notes, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, the big thing that uh, I want to talk about tonight is uh, we all fly vintage airplanes. As we all know, uh, you don't pick the phone up and call Piper Aircraft uh, for everything that uh, we may have on our airplanes. It's not, not like you bought a brand new Lexus and you can, you can go down and, and it's under warranty for the next three to five years. We have a wonderful availability of parts for the most part. You just have to know where to go to get them. Now, for those things that are not necessarily uh, available, uh, we have a couple of different things that the FAA has allowed us to do to get those parts that we need. One of them is covered in Advisory Circular 2327, which is uh, the material parts substitution for vintage aircraft AC. It is a rather sizable uh, advisory circular. It's 18 pages long. Something that if you're really interested in, in, in taking a look at, um, it, it is a good read. And it does talk about the fact that because we have vintage aircraft, if a part is not available from the source with a part number, so to speak, we can replace it with a common part. The interesting thing about Comanches, though, is uh, a lot of the things uh, that are uh, mentioned in that AC are things that are specifically called out in the certification of the Comanche, such as landing lights and batteries and things like that. If you look at our uh, type certificate data sheet, you can't just replace those with a common part, unfortunately, uh, because they are subject to the original certification of the aircraft, right, wrong, or indifferent. And so they need to be replaced with something with one of the other approvals. Now, that brings me to uh, the other ways that you can approve parts for an aircraft. Let me back up a little bit. There are some facts that I want to just kind of throw out there. We aren't unique as Comanche owners. The average age of a GA piston single aircraft right now is 32 years old. The average age of a piston twin is 27 years old. If you are a little more well-heeled, the average age of a GA turbine-powered twin is actually 19 years old. So a little bit... Uh, newer on the turbine equipment, but, but nonetheless, there's uh, a lot of airplanes that are getting up there in years. What if you have to make a part? And this is, I'm gonna get into the owner produced parts uh, uh, side of the house. It's interesting because your AMP or your shop, if they're a uh, uh, proof repair station, cannot fabricate a part unless it's part of a repair under part 43. It's for both. Under part 21, however, you as the owner can material, materially participate in the manufacturing of that part. You hand it to your AMP or your shop and you say, install this as an owner produced part. And uh, we'll get into how that works, but that is the gist of an owner produced part. Now, why would you do this? Well, the aircraft is old or is an orphan. Uh, you can't get the part from an approved uh, uh, parts supply. Uh, parts are available, but they might be waiting on a, a, a run of, uh, you know, 10 parts and you're the first one and it might be six months to a year out. Or let's face it, maybe you can go make the part for a couple hundred bucks and they want a couple thousand bucks for it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily revolve around price, but if you can make a, an equivalent part for less money, maybe you're set up to do that. As, as we get into what the rules say on manufacturing parts, part 65.81 in the FARs is the, the uh, 
privileges and limitations section governing mechanics and part 145.51 is the privileges and limitations of repair stations. And neither of those parts, as I stated, allow manufacture of parts. They can repair or modify parts, but you cannot fabricate a part. There are 10 ways that an approved part can be made under the FAA. Uh, you can have the part PMA approval. You can manufacture it to a TSO. You can have it under a type certificate or a supplemental type certificate. You can have a type certificate with an APIS. You can have bilateral agreement. Uh, you can come up with something that is acceptable to the administrator and have it engineering data and, and made. Standard parts, such as NAS bolts, things like that, those are standard parts. And parts produced per STC instructions. And then last but not least, owner produced parts. Part 21303B permits an aircraft owner or operator to produce parts for maintaining or altering his own or her own product. An owner produced part can only be installed in the aircraft, however, if they own or operate that aircraft. If they're the ones that cause it to be, uh, be made, I can't cause it to be made and I own my airplane and I can't go over to your airplane and say, hey, I made this part. Here, it's an owner-produced part. You can put it on your airplane. No, I don't operate your airplane. You have to do that. An owner-produced part cannot be produced. Uh, I can't make it and have it on the shelf and sell it to you. Uh, you have to do something uh, to cause me to make that part. Then you can have the part. Now, this is kind of one of those. Uh, how, how do you how do you do that? How does this how does this all work? Um, and it's it's a little bit of a gray area. And the legal beagles are always trying to figure out how to define a gray area. They've kind of narrowed it down to five uh, ways that you can participate as the owner to have a part made. You don't have to physically get the tin snips out and start working on it. The five ways, uh, the first one is the owner provides the manufacturer with the design or performance data to have the part made. Uh, if you've got plans for the part, you take it to the machine shop, the machine shop makes the part, hands you the parts back, you're legal. The owner provides the manufacturer with the materials. You are having bushings made, so you have some pipe stock and you go give it to the machine shop, they make the bushings and you go back to your hangar, that's legal. The owner provides the manufacturer with fabrication processes or assembly methods. Okay, that's pretty self-explanatory. Again, if you give them the plans on how to put the stuff together, you're good. The owner provides the uh, manufacturer or does the quality control procedures. So let's say you have something that you know you need and maybe it's available for a lawnmower. <laughs> well, if you determine that it is of like and uh, same quality and same part that would go on your airplane, and yes, Piper did use a lot of automotive parts and a lot of generally uh, uh, available parts down at the, the local uh, hardware store when they assemble these airplanes. And if you can identify the fact that that part did come from the local hardware store and you go down to the local hardware store and you find that part, you look at it real close and you have a quality control procedure that says this is a, exactly the same part as I took off the airplane. You can put it on the airplane as an owner produced part. The, other, uh, the fifth way is that the owner personally supervises the manufacturing of the part. You go to the machine shop, you give them a sample part and you stand there and you watch them make it. It's legal. The big uh, takeaway on that is that, uh, as I said, the owner does not need to be the sole producer of the part, but they must participate in its manufacture. The part is an owner-produced part, but if you produce the part, is it an uh, FAA-approved or airworthy part? The second question is, can I, as the owner of the aircraft, install the part on my airplane? The answer to the first question is, well, maybe. And uh, this is where the FAA gets a little sticky on unproduced parts. The unproduced part must meet all of the requirements of an approved part in order for that to be considered an approved part. So what are the uh, approved part 
um, requirements. And you can think of it as a table. Uh, the approved part is the tabletop and there are four legs. And if you kick a leg out from under it, the table isn't gonna stand up. So the part has to be properly designed. It has to be properly produced and conform to that design. The part has to be properly documented. The part has to be able to be maintained for as long as it is in service. So of those four things, the properly designed, uh, okay, you can have anybody design it uh, as long as it's, uh, it's properly designed. Uh, properly produced, well, hopefully whoever you have produced it, you took that design to them and they do conform to that design. When you bring that part to the shop, you need to identify it as a owner produced part. You need to have the proper uh, documentation as the design of it and that it conforms to the part that you are manufacturing. You need to properly sign it off as I am the owner and I am doing the uh, doing the part. Now, the properly maintained as long as it is in service. That's kind of one of those, okay, if it is the same as the previous part, you should be able to maintain it as per the procedures of the previous part. If it is a disposable part, it really doesn't need to be maintained because you're when it does need to be maintained, you're going to take it out of service and put a new part in. Now that you've got the uh, owner produced part, how do you get it put into your airplane? That's the second question. Well, you as the owner, uh, unless you're an EMP, can install that on the airplane unless it is specifically uh, 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 cited in, in Part 43 as your uh, preventative maintenance. So you have to present it to an AMP or to a, uh, a, a repair station. Now, the, the whole repair station thing versus AMP, I, I'm just going to use shop uh, to describe them both. But they are the gatekeepers for what is legal to be put on your airplane. You can go get all of this done and they can still tell you, no, I'm not comfortable putting that on. That's their certificate and that's up to them. So. One of the things that I would tell you before you go out and spend a lot of time and effort and money to make a part is make sure you have shop that uh, is, is good with it. We, we always, it's just like getting a field approval. Go talk to the FAA first as to whether they're going to uh, uh, approve it before you start modifying your aircraft. So once that happens, they will sign off that they installed the part. One of the things that the FAA wants to see is in that proper documentation is they want to see some traceability of the part. If you go get a part out of a salvage yard or something, you at least have to say what the aircraft, you know, the aircraft that it came off of and if time's unknown, time's unknown. But for an owner produced part, you don't have an airworthiness tag for it. Ideally, what you would do is in your logbook, you would say manufactured owner produced part equivalent to part number such and such, such and such. And then right below it, and then you'd sign that as the owner of the aircraft. And then right below it, the AP would say installed owner produced part equivalent to part number such and such, such and such then sign that off and that is the airworthiness sign off for uh, the part and for the aircraft. And from that point on, if all of those four things for airworthiness are uh, complied with, you have yourself an owner produced part. And the interesting thing that a lot of people also try to do with owner produced part is they, they, they think that the, it's a great opportunity to improve the part. And unfortunately, uh, one of the stipulations for a, an equivalent part is that it has to be equal. That means it can't be better and it can't be worse. If you want to modify a part to make it better, then you have to go through different approval process and that, you know, then get a, a, a PMA or some other um, approval. But as a uh, as an owner produced part, strictly an owner produced part, it has to be of the same material, 
the same design. It has to be equivalent in every way, form, fit, and uh, function and structure. Those are just some of the, the, the do's and the don'ts. If you can use the manufacturer's design, if you can get the plans, that is the best way to go about it. You know exactly what the materials are. If you have a part and you take it in and you have somebody reverse engineer it, you better be sure that the, the materials are, uh, are equivalent. Um, if you don't know what the heat treating was on it, you probably ought to go invest in getting some uh, uh, consult from a metallurgy lab of, of some sort to figure out what exactly it was and then write your own uh, plans based on that. Well, I guess the next thing that I, I, I really uh, would like to do is, uh, is just go ahead and, uh, and take some questions, if anybody has any questions. I'm trying to see this on my phone. If, the, if there is time, can we talk about intersect the intersection of 21.9 with FAR 43.3, owner preventive maintenance? I think she means interaction. Can you still see me? Cause... Yeah, your camera's off right now. I don't know how I got muted and stopped video. Hey, you're back. I'm back. I'm back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. What exactly, uh, CJ, were you uh, alluding to with the intersection of uh, of of twenty one nine and uh, and forty three three? Well, I was thinking about how uh, forty three three, and this is a little bit of a precursor to the forty three three clinics that'll be happening. But normally, forty three three, according to the letter of interpretation from the FAA, is anything that doesn't require complex assembly or disassembly. And so to some extent, it almost seems as if you could go with relatively minor fixes and just get your thing fixed. And then as long as you were comfortable with the level of assembly or disassembly, which for me is getting my oil filter on and for you is a whole different level, then in theory, you should be able to, according to the interpretation letters, you should be able to do minor modifications to your owner preventative through through FAR 21.9 and then go ahead and install them if they're not complex assembly or disassembly, according to the letter of interpretation they did on that. I'm going to uh, uh, say that I don't think that letter of interpretation is going to be around very long because the chatter on that is basically if you can do, if it's only a suggestion, then you can do anything. That was the whole basis for that letter of interpretation that said that the the preventative maintenance items in part 43 were simply suggestions. And so mm -hmm. therefore you could do anything under part 43, mm -hmm. uh, essentially, as long as it wasn't a major modification or repair. That has caused a whole lot of consternation amongst the troops. I would say that you're probably looking at uh, as soon as the FAA gets around to another interpretation that they're going to probably come back towards if it's not said specifically, you can't do it um, as a non-certified uh, uh, person. Of course, for those people that uh, I, I, I'm assuming that everybody's familiar with Part 43 and the uh, uh, preventative maintenance clauses in there that, that say that you can um, you know, replace side windows, you can do aircraft interior, you can do uh, cover coatings, uh, you can do uh, oil changes, brakes, service brakes, you can do uh, change landing lights, the, the whole list of uh, tires. Yeah, they're, they're I'm, I'm probably wing patches, wing patches up to six inches. <laughs> well, <laughs> on fabric amazing. aircraft, yes, not, not stress skin aircraft. So no, but it does include patches on stress skin aircraft. I was kind of amazed. Does where yep. is that? Uh, I'll pull up the list. It yeah. had that list of like thirty, but only little ones. They 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 size limited it. Well, I think you would be I, more I, likely to be right than me. Yeah. Anyway, preventative maintenance is a whole nother a whole nother can of worms. The interaction, I guess, going back to your uh, your your question, the interaction would be if something you manufactured as an owner produced part fell under the preventative maintenance category you would be the gatekeeper and being able to put that on case in point our door handles on a lot of comanches are from a car um said vintage whether it be a, a, a ford or a buick or, or whatever depending on what year and what part they use if you go down 
uh, to the local car parts store and you're able to get a remanufacturer or new old stock of, of that particular uh, door handle and it is the same as your old door handle and it functions the same, has the same splines on it, has the same you know clip to affix it to the, uh, to the shaft, guess what? You can, under owner produced parts, you just have a you just had a quality control moment with that handle and since it is an interior item you can then put it on the aircraft and sign it off as yes it was an unproduced part that i materially quality uh, controlled line one and number two i installed it in the aircraft as the aircraft owner under you know preventative maintenance and you sign it off with your certificate uh, number and you go fly and everything is uh, is perfectly legal. Actually, so that did. would be a case of, of a clear cut case of owner produced parts and preventative maintenance coming together. I did exactly that with my old Comanche. I had to replace the door handle because it fell off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, it's actually quite common. <laughs> and And you would be surprised how many door handles are well, it, vice grips? <laughs> yeah, it, it took AutoZone about three weeks to find it. What does the logbook entry need to look like? The, the, the logbook entry, you need, a, you need a, a, a documentation for the part. Now, it could be separate. It doesn't have to be in the logbook, but if you have a piece of paper or the, the, the plans that you use to make the part, that should be attached in the permanent record of the aircraft for that aircraft that you're using the part on. And in the logbook, uh, entry should be uh, by the installing party, the authorized installing party, whether it be uh, in the case of preventative maintenance, the, the owner, operator of the aircraft, or a properly certificated uh, airframe, power plant, uh, mechanic, or, or a, uh, a repair station, they then would sign off the installation of that article, sign their certificate, and I keep losing my earpod. <laughs> In my case, with the, the door handle, the, my mechanic uh, wrote into the log that the, he installed uh, auto, part, auto parts number such and such to replace Piper part number such and such on this date, this aircraft. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it installed owner produced part equivalent to part number blah 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 supplied by the owner, tack time, date, signature, AMP number. Yeah, I mean, it was all that's, part of the annual, so that was easy. But the, he, he yeah. listed the part number from, from AutoZone and the part number from Piper that it replaced. Officially, uh, that would have to be an owner-produced part, or uh, it would have to be, uh, well, there, there is no, we, we get into the uh, uh, AC for parts material substitutions, AC 2327. If we, uh, if we get into that, that part would need to have some sort of standard certification. In other words, a mil spec or a, a you know, AN, some sort of recognized, even, even a National Highway Transportation certification. But if it's just a part, pot metal part that somebody, uh, uh, you know, die cast, technically there is no certification for it other than you as an owner produced part. So you should probably have signed it off as I'm supplying this as an order produced part equivalent to uh, Piper part number, yada, yada, yada. And that handle then becomes an owner produced part equivalent to the Piper part number. No, well, it's a good thing I'm not flying that plane anymore. There's a hundred different ways people sign stuff off. Most of the time it's not right according to the letter of the law. <laughs> There's always, you know, some stickler that's going to come in and, and, and get all antsy about it. But if, if anybody's ever tried to put an airplane on a 135 certificate, you probably run into that. <laughs> Zach, we've got a stack of questions from the chat okay. window from Leah let's, and Scott. Let's um, go for what it. Are, yep, what are some examples of parts that uh, we need to owner produce instead of currently being available to buy. And Zach, before you answer, Leah and Scott, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Or just go, go Zach? Yeah, go ahead. To add, but uh, we missed the introduction. We're probably the newest people here. Uh, we purchased this uh, um, 250 last year and learned to fly in it. 
So that's why I'm awesome. super new to all this. Well, congratulations. Uh, great, great to have you here. And I hope you're enjoying your airplane. She's beautiful. I guess the, I guess the, the, there's, there's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is if you can't get something uh, that you need, uh, that is something that you should uh, should look for either an equivalent uh, part substitution under the vintage uh, advisory circular or an owner produced part. We are right now having some supply issues with uh, main landing gear uh, strut housings or trunnions. Um, the Australians haven't uh, put any into production yet. Uh, everybody's out of stock, and they're becoming uh, pretty pretty rare at this point, especially for the twins. Uh, the heavy airplanes have a tendency to find uh, cracks in the web. Uh, we used to have a place in Utah that uh, uh, s and uh, Industries that would repair that web. But unfortunately, the owner died, and that's not an option anymore. So that's probably the only thing on uh, on on the horizon that is uh, something that you know owner produced is it may or may not uh, be legitimate. Uh, it's it's also kind of one of those parts that you want it to be you want it to be right. Another place that owner-produced parts is actively being used right now is in the landing gear transmission area. Uh, Matt Kirk has sourced uh, a lot of, uh, of, of parts for those. And when you send your transmission into him to have it uh, worked on, uh, he provides paperwork for you to tell him to do things as owner produced parts that is uh, you you are materially telling him what to do so that is legal so that's that's something that uh, is is used every day frank commented that he had an mlg bulkhead reproduced as an owner produced part <laughs> pretty cool yeah yeah um, uh, yeah I, I did have an issue there on both sides actually um that it led to a quite extensive project involving engineers and, and metallurgists. Uh, I won't go into it here, but I learned a considerable amount. I ended up buying what I understood to be the last um, bulkhead from Piper for the left side. Um, nothing was to be found. We had actually torn apart several twins um, and for looking for salvage parts. They were all cracked. Um, ended up um, having one built. Uh, found a guy that, that builds rocket launchers down at Wallops who was able to take it from scratch and duplicate it. The one question that all this all leads me to is I actually had two built because the whole, uh, all the money was spent. Um, the money and time went into the engineering and finding the right people uh, to be able to do this. Once they did it, it was, it was cheaper to, to make more, more than one part. So I actually have two parts. Um, one yep. of them was in the plane and went in just fine. So thankfully I have zero cracks and I'm good to go with two brand new engines. Um, but at, at this stage of the game, um, I have an extra part. Um, so what you said earlier on, um, I have been told a variety of things, like you, you will always get professional advice on, on both sides um, about uh, how to, if somebody needed it, how I could trans, transition it to them as an owner approved part. Is that a possibility or is this part just going to show me? Absolutely. And, and that's uh, what I'm going to tell you. You know, the, the legal beagles always are looking at the gray areas, but the gray areas are simple. Um, you can, you can give whoever it is that uh, you are going to make that part for uh, because you have figured out how to make that part. Right. So you give them, some piece of paper that describes how to make that part they sign it you give it they give it back to you you hand them the part and they now have a part with documentation that told you how to make the part and you're good to go okay um Does that makes sense rather, uh, yep i'd rather do that without putting my name on it but other than that i'll be good <laughs> well you don't have to you don't have to put your name on it at all they, okay you don't have to say who made the part they're putting their name on the sheet that says make the part as per this gotcha. or whatever. 
and okay. that is their that's their command to you and yeah. you could be xyz machine shop with no nothing you know <laughs> you have you have nothing at the end of it yeah and i don't no want problem. to jump the queue this is cj again but i want to come back to that conversation at the end because we're developing uh, fab shop expertise that we'll be able to take these original standard parts and hopefully make more um so sunny commented asked um how does this apply to something like avionics for example much of it uses rs-232 or d sub connectors this is easy maintenance if you've done it before sunny did you want to add anything <laughs> before zach answers the only thing i'll add is that um most of the most of those connectors are pretty simple. If you've ever crimped one, they're really easy. Mm -hmm. Reading how to connect the Garmin stuff is super mm -hmm. simple. It's not complex. And and so recently, for example, I uh, worked with my A and P to put a JPI eight thirty into my plane, and by connecting it to my GTN six thirty five, it sends fuel data back and forth, which mm -hmm. is great. Um, sure. But adding those pins is super simple to do. I wound up having mm -hmm. him do it. Um, but at the end of the day, something like that, is that, is that okay for us to do or that, is that beyond? Well, that is technically not, um, preventative maintenance. Um, that is, uh, materially messing with the navigation and communication radios, of the aircraft. I know it's gotten a whole lot easier, uh, with everything being basically a plug and play computer at this point, but you're. I mean that's that's technically a a full on maintenance function, not a a preventative maintenance function. Uh, I get what you're saying, uh, and certainly as far as you can do anything as a non uh, certificated mechanic or as a non certificated uh, uh, repairman, as long as you do it under the supervision uh, of a mechanic. So, you know, again, it's, it's a gray area. Um, the, if you have a mechanic that, that trusts you to do that, you know, you can work under the auspices of the uh, uh, apprentice program and you can do work, uh, you can do anything that you're comfortable doing as long as you're supervised by a mechanic and that they then sign off the work. Does that make sense? Thank you for the uh, thank you for the clarity. Well, hey, CJ, uh, how do I ask a question? Well, uh, we've been throwing them into the chat window, but um, why don't you just go for it, Ken, and we'll we'll have you Damn, insert into the queue. Did. Well, you alluded to this guy in Utah with the Trunnions. Are you from? Is anybody familiar? Or you know about JT Evans in Orlando? I had a cracked Trunnion on one of my customers' airplane, and. Uh, we got involved in him not doing him anymore. And I went over to Jim and JT Evans and he had about six or seven of them on the bench and you get an 8130 with him. So I didn't ask you about twins, but he's got uh, well, tons of landing he, gear he, over there. It, well, if he's doing, if he's, if he's doing Piper uh, trunnions of, of any type, I'm sure he could probably get certified for the, the PA 24s and the PA 30s. Well, so, he's not selling, he's not repairing them. He's selling them used, you know, oh, he, magna fluxes, he magna fluxes them. They're salvage parts. He cleans oh, them up, okay. salvages them, die, uh, die, what do you call it? Uh, magna flux them and they're a serviceable uh -huh. part. So that's an outlet that maybe that nobody knows about. Yeah. For the twin uh, drivers. You, you said that's JT Evans? In Orlando, yeah. yeah. All right. And there was somebody else who had welded or repaired a trunnion. Um, so there was another place that had competently repaired them than the one in Utah that I just ran across, but I'd have to go back to the conversation and find out whom. Uh, sounds like there's enough interest that we should probably. Yeah, post that that's in here. that's going to be that's going to be our next uh, our, our next. You know, if if we can get the Australians to to make some more of them, their PMA part, their their drop in yeah. replacement. Uh, but they're, they seem to be having trouble running a yeah. lot of them. So I don't know what is this, the deal is. Is this Utah guy? Did he make the, the web from thin to very thick? Yes, he did. Yeah. They, he put the, he put the bigger, uh, the much thicker web in and, uh, the double bead, which you usually cracked right next to it again, but at I, least it, re it was repaired. I, I had some experience with that. Um, I, Bought my plane and uh, the trunnion was 
fixed by the Utah company, the trunnion broke in another part of the trunnion. What it did yes. was transfer the energy to another part of the trunnion. That's exactly right. Yep. Um, so I would recommend either getting a good uh, used part or go for the Australian trunnion if you can get it, although it's really expensive. Yeah. Could I ask a question about um, something you said? So I think you mentioned, I think they call it the, the colial interpretation, which is the owner maintenance and what's not covered on the list. And you said that you think that's going to be repealed or, or the letter revised. And then the second question, which is related to it, is the mosaic project, which I keep reading about, which is, you know, to treat aircraft of a certain age more as like an experimental type certificate where we can do more of the maintenance and, and so those things kind of, you know, negate each other, what you're saying. So I'm curious as to what your interpretation of that is. Well, the, the, the Mosaic project, if the Canadians have a thing called owner maintenance and it, it precludes the aircraft from being ever used again and for commercial purposes, but you can have the owner maintenance category and that allows the owner to pretty much do anything. Um, it, it's, it's much akin to our experimental uh, rules where if you are the builder of the aircraft, you can act as the repairman for that particular aircraft. That's going to be uh, what I've, I'm told is, is that's going to be all in the, in the part 23 rewrite. And I don't know, there's a lot of speculation and I really don't want to comment one way or the other on that because I just don't know. And I don't think anybody really knows how that's all going to come down. Um, as far as the Khalil uh, uh, interpretation letter, um, there are a considerable amount of pushback from the legal community and from the insurance community, some other places that have a lot of deep pockets and a lot of uh, clout as far as their lobbying skills. The FAA, I don't think, is really comfortable with it either because to, to basically say that uh, everybody is, you know, this is just a suggestion, go out and maintain your airplane as you want to and just sign it off and, and, and rock on with your bad self. Well, what's the point of having uh, certificated people and that starts the whole down snowball effect of, okay, who's really responsible for this airplane? And when it crashes, who, who, whose license do we take? So that's, that's what I'm hearing. Um, again, until things go one way or the other, uh, but that's just, that's, that's what I'm hearing. We've got another question from Patrick Elliott. I'm sorry, did that wrap the question and answer? Uh, if so, we've got another one, a good one from Patrick Elliott. Is there a dollar amount, a level of affordability to determine if a part is available? If I could get the part from Piper, but for the cost of a major limb, can I choose to uh, not do that and go owner produced? You can uh, go Patrick, owner produced. Did you wanna... Patrick, did you want to add something? No, uh, no, nope, that's, nope. that's the whole question. Uh, it, well, the, the, the long and the short of it is you, you can make an owner produced part for pretty much anything on the airplane uh, as long as it meets those criteria. Now, if it's, if it's something simple, it's going to be a whole lot easier to make it cheaply uh, owner produce if you have to go out and you know re-engineer the wing spar or something like that you're going to have you're going to probably have some pushback from whoever's installing it they still have to sign on the dotted line of uh, you know that that it is a certified part and that it meets all the certification and of course if it's a wing spar it's a major uh, alteration, so then you you got to have an IA inspect it and sign it off with a 337. I there is no dollar amount if you can't get the part for a reasonable amount. And what's reasonable, I don't know what it is, but that's kind of what they say. That affects the availability of the part. If it's not available to you because you can't afford it, there you go. Makes sense, Pat Elliott. Does that does that answer the question? Yes, thanks. Okay, cool. Yeah. So um, Pat Kiefer had a very helpful comment, which is that well, once she gets a part number, Google and eBay Motors have been a good source, a couple of sources to find parts. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. 
So, and then um, we have a mystery poster, iPhone 10 number two <laughs> commented, uh, is there, and this was a great idea, is there a reference library where people can list substitute parts as they are found to fit, accepting that they have to become owner supplied parts to be allowed? Um, iPhone 10 two, did you wanna augment or reveal your <laughs> identity before Zach answers? Yeah, sure, can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. Okay, I'm just not used to using Zoom. I use Teams. Um, sorry, yeah, um, I, I'm a Comanche 260B, and I've had a couple of times when I've, I've struggled to find parts. It's lovely coming to the Facebook page and asking the question, and I always yeah. get good answers, but I'm just conscious that uh, I get good answers, and then it gets lost uh, to the next person, and uh, it'd be useful to to be able to do this in a, in a more disciplined way and, and to, to collect the data, I guess. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it is. So um, the, the answer is that um, there, there's uh, been some cooperation between uh, the heads of Delphi Airworthy Comanche, Kirsten Winters, who obviously has been operating an outstanding form for a long time, um, and uh, the Piper Comanche Facebook group, headed by Russ Wright and the uh, one of the brick and mortar organizations in Comanche Town to try to find a way to capture some of the really outstanding content that's generated in the forums. So um, stay tuned because the, the idea is so bang on, but both Kirsten and Russ in particular have noted the exact problem that you just raised, which is outstanding content is difficult to find. Um, Delphi requires a paid subscription or you don't see content after a certain amount of time. And Facebook was never really designed for search. So uh, stay tuned. It's, a, it's an absolutely banging on question. JRD John Dunning said, uh, suppose somebody wanted to manufacture something crucial like a stabilator horn. What would the QC look like for that? Um, up to the discretion of the A&P who you'd talk into installing it. John, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, that's about it. Um, I mean, I understand that it is technically possible, leaving aside the question of whether I would want to fly it. But, but you know, um, I would expect any A&P to push back pretty hard on something like that. Yes, and, 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 and absolutely, John. The, uh, the, the comfort level of, and, and that's why I call it the A&P who's installing it the gatekeeper. Because you can go, you can go build the whole airplane in your garage and come to me and say, put it together. Okay, I might be comfortable with that. I might not be. That's where you have to go find out whether whoever is going to install it is going to be comfortable with whatever you built. Now, again, if you go, you know exactly who did the, the forgings for Piper and you go and you say, I have the plans and I document it and I give it to those people and they do the casting and the forging and the, the you know, everything is, you know, same material, same form, same fit, uh, same function. It's even got the same, you know, forging stamp on it that, that the Piper part has. It's going to cost you more to do that than to buy one from Piper right now. But if the Piper one wasn't available and you needed one and you did it that way i wouldn't have a problem putting it on your airplane you would know, it also would it also work to hire a der for instance absolutely you, absolutely yeah. and 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 go to metallurgy you know do a, sure. a metallurgy analysis you know you can if you can get the plans and you have everything written down ahead yeah. of time then you can you can make it if you have to reverse engineer it it's going to take some doing but you know yeah yeah, yeah. okay fair enough Gary Robinson commented that he had an engine baffle uh, owner produced for his 180 last year. Sure. Uh, Shannon Roddy asks, I still fail to comprehend why finding a 1950 Dodge door handle on AutoZone is any different than finding a landing light that meets and exceeds the specifications, lumens, beam width, current draw, impedance of a GE 4509 bulb. Why is it any different? Thanks, Shannon. <laughs> yeah. We're going we're gonna to play this game again, and I'm going to say the same answer that I've said to you multiple times. The difference is the Dodge door handle isn't listed in the TCDS that says it has to be on the airplane, whereas the GE 4509 light bulbs say that that's the only certified light bulb for the Comanche 
the single Comanches. There you go. Equivalent. Oh, I've got a new one. Equivalent, though. No, no. It specifically says GE4509, and it is specifically listed as a, cat, as a, uh, as a condition of certification. It doesn't, it, the relief of uh, the AC 2327 does not apply to specific requirements of certification, and that is as listed in the TCBS. So if I get GE to release an LED bulb with a part number of 4509. Yes, sir. It's, it's an arbitrary, it's an arbitrary. It's paperwork, it, it is, it, yeah, absolutely, but it's paperwork. Unfortunately, they had, you know, the FAA drew the line somewhere, and that is what it is. It, it, technically, you need to have an STC or a PMA on your battery as well. You can't just use a standard part battery because the only listed uh, batteries for a single Comanche are a Wisconsin power uh, battery and uh, Bowers uh, something battery. Doesn't list the Gill, it doesn't list the Concord, it, it doesn't list the generic you know, G35 battery. Um, it specifically lists that. And that's something that people overlook. It is the letter of the law, the intent of the law, it's your airplane, do with it what you want. I'm just the one that's here to tell you uh, oh, that's, that's, that's the why way the rule still, is. That's why yeah. I'm still flying with GE 4509 bulbs that draw 20 amps of current. I absolutely, uh, you know, I understand your situation and I understand a lot of people's situation. The answer is you put a bulb in there that is PMA to replacement for a GE 4509 and you don't have to worry about it or STC for a replacement for uh, the particular airframe, then you don't have to worry about it. Those are other, other approvals for changing or equivalency, changing the type certificate, a supplemental type certificate changes the type certificate. A PMA provides for equivalency with the certified part that is required by the type certificate. So such as the PMA Whalen or brand names uh, of the LED bulbs that are PMA for direct replacement of a GE 4509. If it's PMA for a direct replacement for a GE 4509, it is the same per the FAA as a GE 4509 going into the airplane. So I'm going to just give everybody a quick time check. We The meeting uh, is up until 9, but we know we said until 8.30. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I'm starting... Go ahead. So feel free to stay. I just, it's a time check. And Zach, I've got about four more questions for you. And, uh, and there's your time check. A really good question. Is there a, Lori asked, is there a list of non-aircraft parts used in the Comanche? Yeah, that would, that would be Larry. Check the beard. It's just a funny way. Oh, sorry, Larry. My bad. Is there a list of non-aircraft parts used in the Comanche? No, there isn't. The simple fact is that once the manufacturer uses a part off the shelf at the auto parts store and puts it in the airplane and then flies away and is blessed by the FAA as airworthy, that part is no longer an automotive part. It is now an aircraft part with an approved part number from the manufacturer on it. That is why uh, there isn't a list of automotive parts. You as the owner of the aircraft can determine that that is an automotive part and you can then do a owner produced part by going down to the auto parts store, getting that part, doing a quality control equivalency of it, and then having it installed in your airplane. That is now went from being a automotive part that you brought once you did the QC on it. Now it is a certified aircraft part because it's owner produced. So in a long way about saying it, you have to determine what is the automotive part and know, you know, it, it, there are some things that we all know are door handles, trim, trim cranks, things like that are all, all automotive parts. But no, there isn't a master list. But we should make one. It's, a, it's now on it the suggestion kinda, list. It kind of depends on the airplane, though, because, yeah. and I emphasize that, we're all talking Comanches here. I can, I can go get you three different Comanches sequential serial numbers and they all have different parts on them but they're all the same part number <laughs> right yeah well that just gives us some options sam mcgill you actually have just introduced one of the topics we're planning and we wanted to ask this at the end so sam asked could maybe comanche owners and pilots form a list of available parts that they might have 
and that they would like to sell or trade. So Sam, you have just introduced the Comanche swap meet that is going to become uh, a regular augmented part. And you're, you're right on. And we had a couple of people be like, hey, can we say what we've got available and what we might like to sell or trade? So is that what you had in mind? Can you hear me? No, yeah. I'm clear. Hey, Sam, how you doing? Well, yeah, that, that's it. You know, I've got, I've got a lot of firewall forward parts that I've visited with Jack on. And, and I know there's other Comanche flyers out here that have parts sitting back on their shelves that they've replaced, and some of them in good shape. You know, we, we've updated and upgraded and tried to make our machines, you know, the best we can. If we had a list like that that we could go refer to, I think it would be great. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got a database expert and a, a website person who actually has just been talked about because somebody else, uh, a couple of the people said the same thing, Sam. And so um, I'll tell you what, we will we'll stick up a link where people can go and say what they want and then we'll make a spreadsheet available of stuff you can that's that's offered and stuff that people want and see if we can start matching up and it, if you want to swap it um then great if you want to sell it then great we'll but for yeah. the first thing we're going to do is get the listing i have one concern with that and, and that is um i've gotten a lot of advice around that owner approved part it says um, I can do uh, like what Zach and I were talking about. The um, mm -hmm. you can transfer it, but you can't advertise it. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I didn't know about that. We'll have to get some clarification. I think um, we'll have to see if a friendly group of just fellow pilots can can. You know, one, can, one thing about that owner produced part, uh, you can't have it on the shelf, but you can say, hey, I made this for my aircraft. I have sourced and have the plans for it. Would anybody like to have me make another one or do something like that? You can certainly yeah. do that. And as as you're not you're not holding it out and saying, hey, I made a run of 100 of them and I got them on the shelf and they're forty nine ninety nine a piece. No, you can't do that. But you can say, hey, I made this part. I went to all the trouble to come up with the plans and whatnot. I have it available. If somebody needs this, I know how to how to do it all and we can we can I can tell you how to make the owner produce part. At which point there you go. Yeah, it just um it, and I won't I won't belabor the point, but to me it gets um it gets sticky. It, it, it gets so sticky that it's, yeah, I'm looking at risk to myself, you know, legal risk. You know, if somebody wanted to argue, then now I'm spending money immediately. I, I don't, I don't see that. Um, okay. You're because you don't, you're still not holding it out. Okay. You, you're still not holding it out. What, what you are doing is you are saying, Hey, you know, I went to the trouble of, of developing this part and getting a getting it over owner produced part. I will share with anybody how I did that. That's, that's exactly the, that's, that's the limit. That's exactly the limit yep. of what I would say. I and, know how, and to, how you how you do that really from fit. that point on, you give them the plans. They yep. sign it. They give it back to you. You're done. Because so now we, they, we have, just need they to... have given you the plans. You you Got gave it. it to them, but they gave it back to you with their signature yeah. on it. So they caused you to do it. That's the legal interpretation. Okay. So in putting in putting this list together, we need to provide good guidance on how content gets into and out of the list. Sounds like. And that is one of the reasons why a lot of people have been hesitant to put lists together. Yep. As far as putting a list together of you got parts. Sure, you got salvage parts, you got uh, serviceable parts, you got new old stock parts. That's easy. Put that on the list. Somebody has made owner-produced parts and knows the sources, whatever, that would might be something that, uh, you know, this part, this part, this part, this part, talk to so-and-so, 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 they have sourced yep. whatever. That might be the way to put it on there. You certainly can't say for an owner produced strut tube called because that you can't say, you know, that he has 20 of them on the shelf. And if you act now, a quick comment from Shannon that baffles are pretty much unobtainium. There is uh, Matt's in conversation with somebody who might be able to help with that. So stay tuned again. But yes, Shannon, you're right. There's a baffle shortage. HPPC well, Matt, comments. Matt is, Matt is making them for a thousand bucks a copy. Yeah, but his but, backlog is large. Yes. And so but he um, is making them. I, I, yes. Yes. Yep. I, think, I think for the pilot side baffle, I would actually pay $1,000 for one. Yep. Unfortunately, um, there, uh, so I was in Alaska uh, a couple of years ago, and there's a company there that was making them 
for 250s, Ooh. 260s, but not 180s. Uh, uh-huh. I, need, I need a 180, um, and it's it's pretty much I've I've not been able to find one at all. And and since then they have uh, quit building the 250s because they said that they were just such a pain in the butt. I yeah. I saw that also. There's an A and PIA with a uh, machine shop and a brand new CNC machine that is looking to try to, that loves old airplanes, has a twin Comanche that he's been restoring that's finally both engines running. And uh, so he's hoping to be able to support Matt with that problem. And that, that conversation is in process. The COVID lockdown is blocking a lot of stuff that looked like it was just about ready to, to happen. So no guarantees, but stay tuned. Um, I've uh, got a funny comment from HPPC, who's whoever that is, saying, uh, so uh, since a twin doesn't specify the 4509, sell the, sell the single and buy a twin, smiley face. <laughs> uh, yep, yeah, that's true. There you go. And then you can change your own landing lights to LED without anybody uh, having a fit. Yes, yes. BJ, can I ask a question? Of By all means. Uh, one second before I uh, jump you in. And Shannon, yes, let's let's work together on doing that. If do you have are you willing to hold off while I get Tom or Com, Tom LeCombe's question in here? Cool deal. So Tom had asked, um, given the scarcity of parts, if you decided to install an unapproved part in your aircraft and uh, and uh, change the plane's designation to Air Experimental, what limitations does that mean as far as no, operation the, of the aircraft? The, the only of, way that you can take a, a in the United States that you can take a, a, a production aircraft and put it in the experimental category is for R and D or for exhibition. By saying that, you know, you can you can't you can't if if you put a Comanche in in experimental, it would be because you wanted to certify a new engine on it or certify a new cowling or certify a new. Uh, a wing high lift device, and that's a that's a research and development uh, uh, thing, and it's short term, and then it has to go back and conform with the type certificate and be relisted in the normal category again. If for exhibition, if you wanted to modify it uh, in such a way that we're doing air shows with it or something, uh, that would be you know you you put you change the controls and you put a stick in it in a center seat uh, you know whatever but those would be those would be two of the categories that that it would would fall under you can't take a you can't take a production aircraft and turn it into a uh, experimental aircraft amateur built unless you build 51% of the airplane so um, that pretty much excludes putting it in experimental um, and having any sort of a useful aircraft. Does that answer the question? Who is and the then the, the person who was just about to, uh, to who verbally wanted to, I've got one more on the list that came in afterwards. So I, who was about to ask a question that I asked if I could do Tom's first? That was me, Dave Gittleman. Oh, cool, Dave. Uh, over to you, and then I'll bring in um, uh, Burnley's. Since since Zach has a 180, uh, two as 180s, I, as I do, I have to ask you a question about how many carburetor heat boxes have you replaced or repaired over the years that you've had the airplanes? Uh, I have I have done define the repair, uh, complete rebuild or just rebush the uh, the, no, com- the complete the shaft. Complete. Complete rebuild. Complete, complete rebuild. I've I've done two. Okay. Um, I want to show you something, and I don't know if you can see it, but this would. I got tired of these things cracking, so let's see. Can you see this? Yeah. I welded a piece here along the top, and I also did it here along the back. And this makes the structure about a hundred times stronger than the original design. Oh. And I have never had to fix one of these after I've done that. And I did that, started doing that 30 years ago. I keep on waiting for them to break, but they never do. That's, so that's an owner produced modified part. And it, so I pointed out to anybody who wants to do that. that That's that, awesome. As as someone who has spent thousands of dollars on 
car bear, uh, car heat air boxes on his 180. I appreciate that. All right. Well, I just thought I'd show it to you. The, the, the funny thing about that, Dave, is uh, I, after the second time that I rebuilt it, I did the same thing. <laughs> well, great minds think alike. <laughs> you know, so since we're here, um, Dave and Zach, do you think you could produce just a half page write up um, with photos on your smart change so that all of us 180 drivers can benefit and we'll post it? Sure. Well, it also applies to 250s. Yeah. Beautiful. I'll take that. I'll take that. See, totally worth the cost of admission. <laughs> um, but seriously, would you guys, uh, would either one or both of you get together and produce a, just a quick like, hey, here's how to fix your carb heat box so you don't have to fix it again in, in 10 years? I'll be happy to post it on the website. I, a year and a half ago, I was, I was ready to actually physically own or produce a new air box because it was, it was almost as hard to find as the baffles. It's very difficult to make. No, it's not. It's not fun, um, but I mean, it's it's possible. Yes. Yeah. Um, somebody yeah. already did that. They made it. Somebody made one out of stainless uh, mm -hmm. several years ago when I was still a member of ICS. Yeah, I was actually ready to just like buy a mill and and just start. I, I have blocks of aluminum, so I, like I was ready to just start milling aluminum. I don't know that you'd be happy with the result, though. I'm guessing that that. Would compared crack. well compared to the perennial cracking and rewelding of cracks <laughs> well, this this fix stops that i could see making it out of a 7000 uh uh series alloy wasting a lot out the mill doing it <laughs> oh absolutely but <laughs> the thing is i've got about 15 solid blocks of aluminum that are about i don't know 6 by 10 by 8 so yeah. I, I could just, I, I, I could mill 15 of them mm -hmm. and it would be no cost because I have that, that aluminum sitting in yeah. the bag. This is CJ again. I have a question <laughs> that I, that a member texted me saying, I can't be there, but could you ask? And it wasn't necessarily directly owner produced. So I wanted to save it till everybody else's questions have been asked. Um, let's see. There's a great suggestion from Burnley to create an LLC so that we can um, publicly own and share this information and with less risk. That's something that we should run by Kirsten Winter, who also, in addition to all of her other attributes, is an attorney. Then I have one from um, Joe Cappuccini, who has a 180, and he was asking me to ask you, and this is the last question other than a kind of a bookkeeping question, um, and then I'm just going to let anybody talk until 9 o'clock when we're going to wrap it up. Question from Joe was, can you... Uh, can Comanche to <laughs> Murray Colette, if you're still there, you're going to be able to answer this one too. The question from Joe is, can Comanche 250 wings be installed on a Comanche 180? I, and Joe, by the way, is an ANPIA as well as a pilot. He said, I think it's a minor alteration, not major. The main reason is the ox tanks that are built in the wings of the 250. Well, the answer, the answer is maybe, and it depends on the part number. The, the 1958, 59, and 60 airplanes, the only difference is firewall forward of the airframe, basically. You could, you could, that's why you can take uh, the change of 180 into a 250 with just a, uh, or vice versa, if, as long as you use all the appropriate parts that's in the parts catalog, it's a logbook entry. However, there were never any uh, 180s with electric flaps. So you can't put 250 flaps or 250 with Fowler flaps on any 180. It's non-conforming. Uh, you can't, no 180 had uh, wing aux tanks. So technically you can't put any wing that has four in internal tanks on a 180 because it's non-conforming. There is no data for that. The 61 so, has uh, manual flaps and four tanks. Not a 180, it doesn't. Not a 180. A 180 does not, ha it never oh, had any, uh, you're, the 61, exactly right, has manual flaps, but it has uh, the four, four tanks uh, in a 250. Yeah, but that makes the 61 a different animal than the 58, 59, and 60. Yeah, you got to watch the serial numbers. So just to clarify, the answer is, if it has the aux tanks in the wings, it cannot be installed in a 58, 59, or 60 180. Any 180. Any 180. No 180 all the way from 58 to 1964 when uh, production of the 180 ceased. 
No 180 had either ox tanks or uh, electric Fowler flaps. The Osborne tips, they're okay on a 180, right? Yeah, but that's an SDC. Okay, just not oxes. Yeah. Okay. That's an SDC. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, this is Murray Collette that CJ mentioned before. I have a 59250 that was then upgraded with Osborne tanks and then later upgraded with ox tanks, changing the wing part number to a later model 250 part number that was acceptable and that worked out okay. But I haven't yes. investigated the 180 since, you know, backing that down to the 180. No, because that it, it existed and certification data existed for the 250. That's how you got away with it. It doesn't exist for the 180 to require recertification of the wing. So, yeah, correct. So if you own a 62 to a 64 180, you can add the aux. No? There is no 180 ever certified by the factory that had either Fowler flaps, electric flaps, or the aux tank. So that you, you would have to recertify the aircraft if you put any of those parts yeah, on obviously, the 180. Obviously yeah. cost prohibitive. So yeah. the only way to get 90 gallons in a 180 is by the tip tanks. Yes, sir. All right. Yep. Dang it. Well, you can put a tank in the baggage compartment. Well, yeah, it's... <laughs> yeah, the, the old and again, the, tanks. the Osborne tip yeah. tanks are legal. Oh, STC'd. Yeah. yeah, it's an STC, yeah, but that doesn't change the wing part. Yeah, it doesn't change the wing part. It does change on some models the gross weight. So, on an older 250, not on a 180, I could imagine that the, the 180 part. gross weight discussion has, has happened on the Facebook group. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. first weight increase on the 250s is, you know, it either goes from 28 to 3,000 or 20, uh, 29 to 3,000, depending on the year. I, I just answered my own question. I said, who can sit in the airplane that long? And then I was thinking of Max Conrad. Hey, I've flown. Actually, I've flown, Ron uh, Kyle did a great session on long distance. I've flown, I've flown eight hours, over eight hours on, on 60 gallons in a 180 Ooh. nonstop. When you're solo, a Gatorade bottle works perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> Speak for yourself. For you, CJ. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'll tell you. When I went out camping in the winter time, I was cursing the guys. They had it so easy. Okay, we got like about five minutes left. I'm going to unmute everybody and have at it. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to go actually eat dinner. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Zach. Yep. Have Thanks, a good day. Awesome with you. Oh, Thanks, great. So thank awesome. you so much. CJ, you should read. CJ, you should yes. read about uh, Blanche Stewart Scott, and her, who was the first woman to fly in the United States? Drove a car across the country. Yeah. For Willie's Overland, and she was a very inventive young woman. And you should read her story about how she solved her problems. Uh, cool. I'll be texting you for a uh, for the exact thing to look up for, for reading that. I'd love to. Okay. So, okay. It, yeah. If anybody has suggestions for future uh, meetings like this, and you want to just throw them into the chat window or drop me an email, we will do our best to make them happen. Uh, sky's the limit, literally. And then um, this is just uh, if you think you might be willing to. Uh, we don't have a way for you to do this right now, so this is not a request for money, but uh, we, we started to figure out what it's going to take to run the corporate Zoom account and also store the videos so that they're available for everybody. And if you think you might be willing to toss a couple of shekels at that one, um, we're going to try to set up a way for people to contribute in the future. Totally optional, just happy to have you here and spread the knowledge. So much appreciate Zach and uh, last uh, week Tom Wasser the longest serving AME in the Northeast and he's going to be coming back and bringing the regional flight surgeon with him um, in in the future probably in three or four weeks so he's a real pilot advocate if you've got medical questions but um, yeah your suggestions are what we're working off of this isn't like we've got any great ideas we're just trying to make what you guys come up with real Okay. CJ. And thanks, everyone. Thanks for the info, CJ. And nice to see you, Dave. Okay. Bye. Bye, Hans. Bye. Bye bye. Yep. CJ, was... bye. Go see ahead. You, Take care, yeah, Dave. CJ, this is Sam. Hi, Sam. <laughs> let's, let's work on a, a mid America 
fly in that some of us Western people can afford to go to, not all the way to Michigan. Okay. You got it. And Pete Morris is, and Ron and Lynn, uh, Ron Ward's on and Peter on are, are fantastic experts. And I totally agree with you. Although with gas as it is, Sam, we might be able to go a little further. Not in West Texas. We're not, we're not making no money now. So. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Part of what I liked about this format is right now with the lockdown, it's the cheapest way to go hang out with your other Comanche pilots. And, uh, exactly. Kind of appropriate. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and well, if you learn how to save a couple of shekels at the same time, what's not to like? Exactly. Um, so yeah, Sam, um, message me or text me, and uh, we'll you and I and the Pete's and Ron and Lynn can get together and get something figured out. Yeah, you're welcome, everybody. Thanks for all the thank yous. That's really much appreciated by everybody. Nine of us on a call last night, just making sure that we had the process nailed down so it would go smoothly. So we're so appreciative of you all for joining. What's everybody's lowest prices? I was actually flight planning because I got to get the airplane over for annual and I'm going to be stopping at a place that's two forty seven a gallon in New York. That is cheap. It's good. Can, I, it's, uh, can anybody beat that? Um, below Springfield, Missouri was two forty five at uh, I think it's 4M1. In New York, that's was sweet. that Sky Acres? Uh, no. No, it's actually not Sky Acres. Huh. I think Inyo Kern, California was selling for like a buck fifty a gallon. Whoa! Yeah, I saw that it was just a certain time limit, 4,000 gallon limit. Yep. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah CJ Nashua. 6,000 gallons just to get there. Yeah, what's Nashua at? Nashua, it's, Nashua. Still, it's still five and a quarter. Well, if you guys all really want to feel my pain, um, I'm currently based at Caleb and it's six bucks a gallon for 100 low lead still. I looked on 100 LL the other day and it doesn't really seem like the lower prices have hit Pennsylvania yet, and I don't understand why. Ouch. Yeah. I mean, when, when you know, oil is like negative per barrel, it seems like. <laughs> I, I know. I was reading they're actually having to pay people to take the oil right now because the demand's so low that the stockpiles are full. Isn't that crazy? Uh, like, it's back up to about $25 a barrel. Oh, wow. Hmm. I got gas Sunday afternoon just northeast of Charlottesville, Virginia, and it was about four and a half a gallon. I had a discussion with the travel agent, and this is a little interesting. We talked about whether the small long haul mission aircraft like the Comanche and its brethren, you know, the Bonanzas, the Moonies, um, the. Uh, might not have a place in the post-COVID era for people that still are not comfortable being around other people. And she thought that it might because uh, she said travels and tourism are way down. They're probably going to get support. And so there may be, uh, strangely enough, there may be a place for a fleet of little airplanes being flown part under, under Part 91 or 135 just to get people from A to B in their own social group. Yeah, I, I think that's the key, CJ, in their own social group because... Um, as an angel flight pilot in the Northeast, yeah. I'm very careful and backing off those missions. The missions themselves have dropped way off mm -hmm. as, as electives, as, as all stop. But yeah. it becomes a decision of, am I going to be exposed or did I expose, uh, you know, someone who is um, critically, you know, ill right. in the cockpit of the Comanche? Mm -hmm. And there's maybe ways to, to work it. I mean, the airflow through the Comanche is kind of, is, is pre very predictable in the air, but on the ground, it's different. Um, <laughs> yep. And you know, how, do you, you know, how do you manage that is sort of the things I'm thinking with, while also being a first responder in my town and having to go into work every other day to you know, meet with other people. So I'm, I'm probably the, the risk in the factor, so I don't want to expose anybody in the, in the angel, fight, in angel fight process. Yeah. Yeah, especially with the angel flights, the, the, the people that are riding are already uh, involved. They're yeah. the floor list. Uh, yeah, we very, are at that uh, magic time, actually, people. It's Nine o'clock, yeah. Just a quick note that I happened to glance over at my participants list at some point, uh, and at that time there were 54 people with some that had come and some that had gone already. So we had a pretty good sized fly in. Yep. Yeah, it's very good. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, there'll be another one next week and we'll get a meeting uh, invitation out a lot sooner this time now that we've nailed down our process.
So and thanks for being here. Hopefully this uh, recording will be on the website uh, available maybe in a couple of days. So we'll send a list out. We'll send a, a, um, a summary of this in the first one uh, with links to the recordings. And uh, we'll post them on Delphi and on Facebook. Nicely done. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, don't forget you can social distance at 5,000 and above just fine. <laughs> Y'all take care. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. That's host. I'm going to end the meeting. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Pete.